Bab with the Contemporary Guitar Blog. And today, my special guest joining me from Long Island, New York, is Kyle Miller. Kyle is half of the uh, chamber rock duo Ictus Novus that just had a force track EP uh, hit Bandcamp um, in early February. And uh, we're here to talk about the music on that, the band, and um, you know what's coming up next for the group as well. Kyle, thanks so much for joining me this evening. Yeah, of course. Glad to be here. So um, let's just talk a little bit about Ictus Novus and how you guys got started up. You know, um, you and Matthew Kowalski on percussion mm -hmm. um, have been working as a duo in isolation during the pandemic. Um, talk a bit about like how long you guys have been playing music together, if you've ever actually played music together. <laughs> right. Um, and, uh, you know, just a little bit of the history behind the group and, you know, leading into the release of this little EP you've got out. Yeah, so uh, Matt and I met uh, two su two summers ago, so the summer pre-COVID, um, and it was we were both going into our masters at QC. I was at Queens College for uh, in my undergrad, so I was there for a while. Um, he had just joined, and we got together uh, through the Gamelon Ensemble at Q QC that um uh, both of us are very involved in. I've written music for them. Um, and we were at a uh, gig down in Asheville, uh, North Carolina. And I remember there we were prior to that, like at rehearsals or whatever, we were just talking about contemporary music, you know, things we're interested in. And then when we were actually at the uh, at the gig, I remember there was a couple of moments where him and I would like just, you know, go off on a walk or whatever and like realize hey, we actually like genuinely like the same music um um and like the same specific areas of contemporary music uh and rock music as well <laughs> and he you know was just had, had asked me at that time while you know um while at qc because he's a performance major though he does also compose um he was just looking for people to play with and you know of course I am too. So, you know, that yeah. kind of sparked the idea. Um, and we were at school just kind of doing some chamber stuff together here and there in Gamelon and then actual with our primary instruments. Um, we played uh, You Broke It, but You Broke It, You Bought It by Timo Andres. Uh, Living Earth. Fantastic show. duo, <laughs> um, duo piece for electric guitar and uh, vibraphone. Viber, vibraphone yeah yeah and that that's kind of what really like solidified the two of us wanting to play together because the dynamics there were really good and i will say that was like um i actually don't know if i ever told him this but some of the one of the more comfortable like performance rehearsal environments i had been in um where i was just like really playing you know my part the way i wanted to just because i didn't feel the pressure um of like someone you know uh and then from there we uh actually with the gamelon group we went to bali to study music um and him and i were living together while we were there for those couple weeks um realized like hey we're compatible people <laughs> um and had the idea already to play some music together so that kind of kind of pushed things forward together and push things forward even more um, and we came up, or really Matt came up with the idea of the cage arrangement. Didn't really know what that meant. Um, but it was an idea, something to like grasp onto, um, keep in the back of our minds. Uh, and when we got home from that, pretty soon after, uh, we got together in like a practice room at school and we just had the cage score in front of us. Uh, which for anyone who isn't aware it's uh, like all well, the notes you see are not what you hear <laughs> so we yeah, were trying to was... you know playing the record back and you know constantly going back uh, and really just dictating all the notes um trying to figure that out and how it worked on the instrument and 
that's really kind of how it started. Cool. So you were taking the cage and taking a recording of that performance and trying to figure out what all those piano pre preparations do um, by ear. Yes. In terms of the resultant pitch from those. Um, yeah. So there might be some yeah. wrong notes in there, but like, yeah, what are you going to do? <laughs> <laughs> I don't think Jake Cage would care. <laughs> He might, he might not. Who knows? I mean, that was the other question I had for you. It's like, you know, this um, cage, you know, the, the cage piano sonatas are just like such introspective um, and very um, delicate little pieces. Yeah. And the two of you have taken them and turned mm. them into real like headbangers. So um, do you think that this is something that cage would even like or is this just like hey this would be kind of fun let's do this um the attitude kind of all the way through is more just like this will be fun let's just do this yeah um and there we were definitely trying to stay um I don't know if it necessarily true to the initial music's the right way to put it, but definitely respectful, you know. Yeah. Like a, we were really there were moments in this to the best of we our ability. Matt was trying to like mimic the timbre in some places with his drum set. Um, when he did put in his own rhythms, it wasn't uh as you could probably hear. It's not like him throwing in drum fills. It's throwing yeah. in sound effects that fill the space. Yeah. You know, so it's like, yes, we're we turned it into our own thing, but we don't want to uh, like we're still trying to pay respect to the initial idea. Yeah, absolutely. It comes off really well, I think, Appreciate even though it. it's wildly <laughs> different from yes, what we're used to sure. hearing with these pieces. Um, so cool. Um, you know, so you have three other compositions new compositions mm -hmm. on this record one from you one from matt and one from jake james a solo Correct. electric guitar piece yes. um so let's talk a little bit about matt's piece first um r and r um which is a short little little thing um <laughs> talk a little bit about about the piece and kind of um how you guys worked it out and um you know then and also these pieces you know when were these written did did you guys have to write these pieces while being isolated or did these pieces come to life um you know pre-pandemic so i'll answer the the last question first the cage was um if i remember correctly was pretty much in place at the latest at the start of the pandemic um maybe matt i think matt probably tweaked some things in his part here and there but my part was um i had my part almost memorized at that point yeah um and that was the only one that was rehearsed and that we had, like had a performance date which obviously got canceled but that was the only one that really got truly rehearsed um matt's piece r and r we rehearsed it once um just before the shutdown uh just to like kind of work some things out for me to give him some feedback on the guitar writing. Uh, Jake's piece. I don't know the, the long term. I don't know the trajectory of his piece, but I received his um, like midsummer. Um, and then my piece, I actually recorded, uh, excuse me. I, I composed probably like June, July, and yeah. we recorded it pretty soon after that. Um, but yeah, about I guess R and R specifically. Um, the original piece title was called Aaron Copeland, and then in parentheses, you know what the piece is actually called uh, R and R uh, from Remorse Code. And what uh, Matt had done, it's really interesting, just because he's a very he's a percussionist. His rhythm is what he cares about, and he had a teacher uh, in his undergrad where he was studying percussion that. I was studying composition that was really trying to get him to focus more on harmony and melody and, you know, the stereotypical things that a composer looks at. Mm -hmm. 
and he was just after a while and after trying to focus on that he just he was just like nah this is this is not how we do things in my book um he's a percussionist so what he really likes to focus on as you hear is just like the intricate rhythms yeah the awkward rhythms that somehow kind of work um so he, there's a passage in aaron copeland's I, I didn't read the book myself but uh I believe it's, um, I don't know if it's a biography, uh, autobiography or biography. That, um, Is it just Aaron Copeland on music? Yes. Yeah. Yes, that that's the one. Um, and there's a passage in there that struck him. I, I wish I knew the passage off the top of my head that he, uh, I don't know the right word, like dictated or notated out in Morse code and then translated that into rhythms uh -huh. and then that was his you know like his rhythmic structure of the composition gotcha. and then from there just kind of he even told me like as far as the notes were concerned and when i was giving him feedback he's like i'll change the notes to whatever is physically possible on the guitar that doesn't matter <laughs> yeah. um so yeah and then there's even a section in the score when i'm just like play this shape move around um, huh. and when I was recording it, I was literally just, it, it was pretty randomized what I was doing. Yeah. Um, and that's kind of the vibe of, yeah, that's really like the vibe of his piece and how his came about. And we only rehearsed it or read through it once. Yeah. And then you were doing this separately and working Correct. stuff out. Um, to what degree did the separated nature of your collaboration affect things at all um was anything easier to work out was anything different to work out or was it like hey we're just gonna do this and we're gonna do this on screens and talk about what works and what doesn't and you know record stuff with click tracks uh, asynchronously and just make it work uh, yeah so there just thinking back i don't actually know if there was a significant amount of conversation to be honest um because hmm. also with our scores we try to other than the cage which was already re rehearsed um but with my piece and matt's piece uh we kind of know where the other guy's coming from and we also try to write enough info into the scores themselves that uh we don't have to necessarily waste time asking questions which like for me yeah. as a composer um is important to me you know uh like if my score if you have to as a player if you have to call me up to ask me a question that means i do my job um yeah. so that's kind of the and we thankfully we both have that attitude um so, which just saves us an enormous amount of time um the only times we we're really talking to each other uh communicating it was actually more during the writing process for me with my piece of just like hey is this possible you know is this the right way to notate this um mm -hmm. versus like the after after the fact um and him like sending me parts which he didn't really when he sent because i did all the production when he sent me the parts um he just sent them to me there was no like uh preliminary like voice memos or anything he just sent me the drum recordings you know and that was kind of it what we what he sent me is what i had and for better or worse kind of just because due to the timing we neither of us really wanted to do redos um just because also in this environment it's really easy to get nitpicky yeah and we did get nitpicky because we could <laughs> you know in terms of just recording ourselves so like any way we could leave some room for error you know to make it sound human we tried to go for um, but yeah, it was all to record it to click tracks, um, try in places, try to place in our like decrescendo time in or program in our crescendos, decrescendos and so on. Um, like but yeah, it's all stuff. Oh yeah. 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 It's a lot, a lot of post-production I spent, um, to be fair, I was, I mean, learning how to do it as I was doing it, but I spent yeah. more time mixing it than I did recording it <laughs> yeah. same goes you know so same for with matt well one of the running themes on this series is how we're all learning 
all these things about the technical side of making music because now we have to and the ways that musicians like us are adapting to um, creating things when we can't be in the same room together and using the technology that we have that there are people who have been dedicated to doing it and we're all just learning this stuff on the fly um mm -hmm. so let's talk a bit about your piece or may um which is the other piece with both you and matt playing together just talk a little bit right. about you know how that piece grew this is a piece that you wrote during the pandemic knowing that it was probably going to be a long time by the time you were getting around to writing this that you and matt <laughs> would be able to play in the same room again um what is what what about knowing that influenced the way you wrote the piece and um just talk a little bit about um kind of how it came about you know what does orme even mean it's a made-up word <laughs> nice um yeah so there's like a, a running theme that i'm growing out of now uh in my music that i just like <laughs> You know, I really wish we could just name things string quartet number one and, you know, symphony mm -hmm. number one still, but that just doesn't fly um, with, you know, in the same regards to, to how it did, you know, 100 years ago. Uh, God, I hate t titling my pieces. <laughs> um, so next best thing is to make up a word, though. I Like I just said, I am starting to uh, get over that a little bit. Um, but yeah, so it, it really has absolutely no meaning unless you want it to have a meaning. I once had a player, uh, clarinetist, play one of my pieces who didn't look up the word, guessed what it meant, and had a beautiful story and a beautiful musical interpretation of the piece that kind of went along with her story. And I was like, you know what? That I guess that's why I made up the word, so you could do that. Yeah, um, you know, I think that composers do that with music all the time to give the performer some degree of agency to right. make the music their own and to do that with a title um is kind of playing this the same card from a different deck right and exactly and even like from the audience perspective because then it like it leaves you wondering and then filling in the blanks yeah um in theory at least um but yeah so that was recorded excuse me that was composed like i, I said i think like june or july um and that was actually the first piece in a couple years that i had written for guitar on the guitar mm -hmm. um i took a break from uh really writing for the instrument on the instrument uh just to you know just put myself in a different mindset um and really like get myself out of the habit of like when i'm composing for the guitar falling into you know the shapes that fit into my hand nicely um and there was a point too during my undergrad i got like raging tendonitis um that's <laughs> not fun but one of the cool things about that is that i ended up writing a couple pieces that thankfully no longer will won't exist beyond my uh my laptop uh for the guitar but it really trained me to just like think about the instrument from the non-guitarist guitar composer's perspective and like writing things out and just realizing sometimes they just don't work sometimes they kind of work and sometimes and but are not worth doing sometimes they kind of work but they're cool enough that they are worth doing and i just got to stretch yeah. um so it, it kind of gave me a different lens on that and this was the first piece that i had written uh in a couple of years where i real every note was written on the instrument um and it was kind of really just refreshing just to you know see my personal growth in that regard and just like i know more shapes after playing some bach <laughs> uh so that it, in that sense is really cool but um because of that too is like the first time i was able to like tap back into like my metal upbringing um and really writing in the style that or more mature style that i was writing in in my previous band omnia um like an instrumental metal band which like we only have like one or two songs worth listening to um maybe <laughs> uh but uh it was kind of like tapping into i guess like that 
sort of mindset that I let purpose, I really quite purposely let go um, for the sake of coming back to with a new mindset later on. Cause I, I knew I would get back to it, um, but I wanted to check out, you know, the more traditional route for a little bit before I uh, got back into it. And yeah. So aside from learning more fingering shapes, what else did stepping away from the guitar um, do for you as a composer that manifested itself in Omnia or sorry, Orme? <laughs> yeah, similar words. Uh, using my ear to compose versus my hands and like, yeah quite honestly like not giving a crap if i have to stretch and, and yeah. to be fair everything is po is like definitely possible on the for the instrument um but like and and a lot of it too is you know playing a bunch of bach lute suites or whatever uh you learn to handle polyphony um so that just became another tool that it just in general is very important to me as a um just a guitar player outside of composition um just trying to it, it's becoming a practice of mine of trying to like improvise with uh um and improvise manipulating polyphony in real time <laughs> i still have a long way to go but at least i understand the concept yeah. um but th this was kind of my way to like explore a lot of those um those concepts and dealing with counterpoint and harmonic structures that are more based around my ear than some textbook yeah so let's talk about jake james's piece let's talk about who jake james is for yeah. probably many of us who don't know and um you know this is a solo electric guitar piece mm -hmm. um so matt got to take a break on this one <laughs> um just talk about the piece um and what it's doing and all of that yeah yeah so jake is he's a good friend of mine i he is another qc composer uh he like me he did his undergrad there and is currently in the master's composition program with me um and last spring matt and i were trying to push for all the composers to write for us mm -hmm. uh just like easy way to get rep also like right um we were an ensemble that wanted to play new music which you don't right. get a lot of those especially in our particular school um the problem with that is some of the composers are more can be more traditional so like electric guitar and drum set scared the crap out of them uh <laughs> so kudos for jake to uh taking a stab at 50 percent of it um yeah but yeah so he we invited them to compose music for us and um and i was aware that his piece was kind of in the works for a little while um and he sent me some drafts i sent him back some comments and then he sent me another draft and then that eventually became what i recorded um and yeah it just became this like kind of improvisatory-esque piece like with these very clear motives um throughout uh to be honest i never actually I, I tend not to um with at least with these particular pieces really analyze them so i can't talk about them theoretically um it was just more about the sonic effect and it's yeah it just it reminds me i even told this to, to jake or i don't if you're familiar with harvey valdez it reminds me of some of his solo records mm. um just n more composed out versus improvisatory um okay his most recent record specifically um but uh also i failed to mention jake james himself he's like a legitimate uh irish fiddle virtuoso okay like, fantastic vir like and touring um that's like how he pays for school is oh, by man. working with a uh irish uh dance company as one of the musicians so he's very very skilled in that domain um and a dancer as well irish dancer wow. uh 
which you don't get that vibe whatsoever. <laughs> um, yeah, I was going to say that <laughs> world of music is not making its way into this piece. If I no, remember right from which is I find that really interesting is that he's like and I've heard he's has some other pieces that I've um, heard while he's been in the program that like he has this for whatever reason for better or worse or maybe he's just trying to keep things separate like i've yet to see much overlap which is kind of interesting yeah um so but yeah so that's kind of his personal background um whether you see it or not and really to the the track itself um he kind of sent it to me like out of context i at that point matt and i weren't like confident that we would be making a record um and then after we got some music recorded and Matt and I had some plans to do some more that kind of bailed, uh, we just bailed out on them. Uh, I had this recording of Jake's piece that kind of fit the vibe. And we said, just, Hey, let's just throw it on. <laughs> yeah. Well, cool. So um, what's next for Ictus Novus? Um, where do you go from here? um are you seeking out more repertoire um what's on the horizon for the day that you can actually be in a room together and make music together and maybe be in a big room with a lot of other people who want to hear it <laughs> right uh yeah so we are actually already in the midst of recording the next record okay. um last january we recorded two of my pieces for the record and this one will be more um guitar vibraphone oriented okay. I, I don't think there'll be any drum set on this um simply because he, right now he's in his last semester of his masters and he's just dealing with a lot of vibraphone so his vibraphone chops are um okay really there uh so that's kind of what we're dealing with at the moment um i'll have four pieces total on that record and he, he will have a solo <laughs> um yeah. i'll take a back seat on this one for a little bit and then we're having him compose uh at least one piece for us and then at least three by compose excuse me at least two others by composer friends at qc okay and all are kind of just like we're all different thing and this one this time around uh besides matt and i those two other composers we're all you know all combined we're all very different composers some more traditional some mm -hmm. One guy is more on the min minimalist end of the spectrum. So it'll be, um, and I'm excited to hear all the different music. It'll be a really interesting mix. So this is not necessarily a notated heavy metal mingling with classical composition kind of group. You guys are planning to expand your palette a little bit, um, you know, focusing a lot on <laughs> vibraphone on this next record. Um, so much more of a guitar and percussion ensemble than a guitar Correct. and drum set band. Cool. Correct. Yeah, yeah, that's for sure. Um, part of the reason we chose the drum set in the beginning was, uh, you know, in terms of writing this music and maybe having other people play it, like odds are every guitar player knows a percussionist of some sort yeah. and odds are that percussionist owns a drum set. <laughs> um, so in terms of that, ensemble it just made sense um but like i said it's just he doesn't have the drum kit set up at the moment <laughs> and yeah. some of the actually both of the other composers that we're uh featuring on this record they specifically were more interested in the guitar vibes than the guitar drum set mm -hmm. therefore you know just to make matt's life easy and I've been in his space. It's super tiny. Um, I was like, you know, I'll just write for, I'll keep it consistent for you. <laughs> you know, yeah. this way too, when we record, we don't have to move mics. Yeah. <laughs> well, very cool. Um, Kyle Miller of Ictus Novus, a uh, four song EP on Bandcamp, self-titled. Um, there'll be a link down in the description box below to go check that out. Kyle, thanks so much for having a chat with me. Yeah, thank you for having me. Great to be here.